Pretty We're gonna, I think our, our judge is going to take a quick turn at it. Congratulations, Judge. I'm going to try my best since we are in the house of God, not to cuss. But we were on two different uh, phone calls today, and one of them I, I basically ended it because, like I told them, uh, talking to y'all they ain't doing me a damn bit of good. Uh, so the frustration that, that you have, we're having it. Uh, there was You said a little while ago that they're flying out. I was all excited when we were flying them out of Laredo. Fly them back to point of origin. If we do that... If we do that, that's that's a deterrent. If we feed them, I'm gonna be careful with that. We'll leave that one alone. Uh, but we gotta send them back. And you just said right now, what's the answer? The answer is send them back. We got over 300 people, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sheriff. We got over 300 people on the other side that are waiting to cross legally, and they're waiting for Title 42 to go away so they can come across. Wow. On that and that's great that those people are wanting to come across legally. 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 Yeah. The key is legally. The, that, that's the key. So on, on the 8th, I think we've got our vice president fly, flying somewhere into Mexico. Uh, yeah. You know, so Title 42 might go away June 8th. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. But more than likely going to go away the 21st of this month. So we're going to have another way of coming across the bridge and coming across. It is what it is. On Sunday, we were notified uh, by Sector Chief that we would have 91 people released on Monday. All right? That 91 turned into 334. Okay? Uh, when we were on the conversation on Monday, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? Uh, we've got two more buses coming. Don't feed them. Turn them loose. So that's when I did a video, and I, I need y'all mad. Uh, so when I sent them to and said and, and, and let's take them, drop them off at Stripes, I don't care what you do with them. Right. We're not going to house them at the Civic Center. My opinion, because I'm not city. We're not going to house them at the Civic, Civic Center. We're not going to put them at the Chihuahua Center. We're not going to put them at the Joe Ramos. Uh, turn them loose. And then we deal with them. The problem is, though, and the lady just said send them back. I get that. I can't. Don't let them across in the first place. I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. It's a policy. We can sit there and scream at each other all day long. We don't have that power. And then if we could, we would. There was a conversation I just had with you a little while ago about getting them uh, trans, uh, trespassing and start writing citations. If I begin to do that, and you, know, you just touched on it, and, and we have 171 by the time you get done, 130, 141 beds somewhere that we can use. After 110 beds on the state level, it begins to cost us. I make $15 a bed for everybody over 110 beds that's not being used, or $15 for, for every bed that's not being used on the state level. So it's going to cost me 90 bucks a bed on the state side when I have when I have somebody in there. DPS stops them. I'll get with you in just a minute. DPS stops them. Uh, they go onto the state side. They go into our side. $90. By the time we get done, $15 I don't make, send me some odd dollars I got to pay. So anything over 110, the other day we were sitting at 135, 132, 135. So if you take 25 beds that I have to pay for, I'm going to be a half a million dollars that I'm fixing across all of y'all. It is what it is. So if I start writing more tickets on the state side, I can't afford it. Hopefully on, on the 10th, next Thursday when Governor Abbott shows up, Hopefully you'll have an answer for that, and maybe we'll get reimbursed. But I make $1.1 million off of GEO that, I, that we put into our budget and we spent uh, for y'all. But when I go to take a half a million dollars out of that $1.1 million, uh, at some point, we can eat it this year. We ain't going to eat it next year. And it's going to be a hard cost. You know, uh, it, it is what it is. I wish we could send them back. I really do. If we could send them back, I'd be happy. If we could just get them out of my county, I'd be happy. You know, the conversation that I had today with congressmen and some people was, uh, ship them out. Can't you just take them to San Antonio? He says, well, you can kick the can further down the road. Well, if I can. You know, because if they get to San Antonio, there's a bigger hub. They could, there's, there's more buses. There's more planes. There, there's, there's trains. There's all kinds of stuff. The answer, the answer would be, and she's shaking her head again. The answer would be to send them back. That's the answer. Do it, and he said a little while ago, do it legally. Right? And so did the man from a little while ago that spoke, do it legally.
but we're sitting in a situation right now that it's, it's not happening and we're, we're sitting here screaming and, and getting mad but we all know what the problem is. We don't have the individuals that can fix it in the room. We're doing interviews with Fox News. Hell, they already know what the problem is. Sorry. They already know what the problem is. Uh, but what we need to do is get CNN and MSNBC for them to use, to, for them to push it out. Are they going to? No. They're not going to do it. So all of us in here, we know there's a problem. I mean, it, all of us. I mean, I'm sitting there looking at the commissioner. We have this conversation every day. He gets phone calls, I get phone calls. Uh, I will tell you that, that I don't know why I, but, but we get, we're, we were called on, on, uh, on Sunday that they were going to release 91. Again, 334. And then on Tuesday, another 198 by lunchtime. You know, that's how come you had people everywhere. We ended up with four buses from Greyhound on Tuesday trying to get them out. And I, I told you all this a little while ago. We had 334. We'd gotten 40 out on, uh, on Monday. And Tiffany Burroughs from the NGO was good enough to be able to get four buses, four big buses, a couple small buses out from Greyhound to get them out. But at the end of the day, I had another 189 come on Tuesday. So you, you keep seeing them. You get people asking for money at Tractor Supply, at Sonic. I mean, we have issues. And we're asked now that at what point... Can I shoot him? And I said, I promised, I told y'all that I wouldn't say that, but it, it, it scares me. You know, I gave you a story about my kids. Uh, people feel scared, they're threatened. And, 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 you know, I don't know. I mean, again, we're sitting here going back and forth, but the people that could actually make the decision and fix this, you can't bend their ear. You can't get them to come to you. And, and as an elected official, all of us, and I sit here looking at my commissioner, or our commissioner, and, and judge, I mean, you've been there. What do you do? I mean, you're screaming and, and you're calling. And, and like I say, one of the conversations this afternoon, like I told them, I appreciate it. Thank you, everything for y'all are doing. But me talking to you, waste of time. Ain't gonna, ain't gonna do no. Take a stand, all of these people. That's it. Together. That's it. But it takes. It, it's not gonna be them. It's not gonna be them. It's gonna be y'all. It's gonna be all of y'all, sir. Conversations and part of, and I'm going to give the judge props and the commissioner also for this is some of the hidden costs that you don't understand are the indigent burials. When a legal crosses and they die, if they die in the river, they die on the banks and we recover their body, the county bears the brunt of disposing of that body. It's up to them. That means an autopsy to try to identify them. Um, it also means a burial of some form. So that's another thing. One other argument that we've also heard is how can we support an illegal alien when we don't support our veterans? Our county does support our veterans. And when you talk about busing them to San Antonio to the bus stop, our county buses our veterans to San Antonio to go to their doctor's appointments. So those are some hidden costs that, that not the average person knows, but they're out there. So one of y'all real quick, because we're losing time. This is a, a solution that I think you would be empowered to do. It's a difficult one, and I've been trying to do it for the last couple of months, but I, I have, have hit walls with it. And it has to do with Border Patrol. We, I think we're all supportive of our Border Patrol here. We love our Border Patrol. This is, this is what I would like to, to see. Border Patrol is a very strong law enforcement agency. There's 20,000 of them, and they have a very strong union. I want to see, because they're federal law enforcement officers, they have sworn to uphold and defend and protect the Constitution of the United States, no matter who's in office. That's right. So let's get behind them. Let's get a town hall with the sector chiefs of Border Patrol and say, enforce immigration law. It doesn't matter. We need to force the hand here. We need to force the hand, but Border Patrol doesn't have any backup right now. They're, they're just following what they've been gagged. They can't speak to the media. They just want to do their job. That's why but they need here. to feel the backup from the, the, from the people because they don't want to get fired. They don't want to be the scapegoat. But they definitely have the law behind their back, behind them, saying, the Biden, tell the Biden administration, you know what? We're not going to let them in. We're going to enforce immigration law. What's going to happen when that gets to Biden's ear? 
when the sector chiefs, they all have to be in, in, in coordination because they can't be just the real sector. It's got to be the real Grand Valley, it's got to be little Paso, it's got to be everybody. They need to come together, especially with the union. They have a really strong union. And let's say, gather, come together and say, we're the Border Patrol. We're going to patrol the border and we're going to secure it. Right. Let's send a message to Washington just to at least have the Biden administration react and do something about it. I'll be quick. I just want to add to what Victor said. One other thing you could do for me, not maybe not necessarily for the group, is I'd like to try and get in touch with active duty Border Patrol officers who have information about things they're being told to do or not do. There's a lot of nonsense. There's a lot of lying. I mean, this administration will never serve you. It just won't. But they're the ones who get the memos every day or five times a day telling them to change what they're doing. If one of them is willing to talk offline and have a phone call or an email conversation, they don't exist. But that information can be gotten out. And like in theory, some of the folks here who are former members of Congress know if the Republicans who are still in Congress can get their act together, there can be some shadow oversight that could make lots of noise, and that'll help next year's congressional elections. So, but if just send them my way, please. The judge wants to add to something, and we got to get to our citizens. That one of the conversations that we had today, as we were coming into town, was with uh, Congressman Gonzalez and also our Deputy Sector Chief Ortiz and our, our Chief here, Scarrow from Border Patrol. They have already asked for dates from the Civic Center to do a town hall meeting and come in and speak uh, to the citizens of Alvarez County. That was a conversation this afternoon at, at you know, a little after 1.30. So both our Deputy Chief, uh, Chief Ortiz, which was stationed here before, one of our, our locally grown individuals and our chief uh, Scarrow on the conversation we had this afternoon after one you know like I said after one about, about 1 30 they have already asked for dates uh, in order to have a meeting with the citizens of Alberta County that's happening they, they're gonna come on yeah I'll be I'll be super fast uh, look just to just to circle back to the original question uh, like an hour ago uh, the uh, <laughs> Look, from, from, from statehood in 1845 to about 1920, for 75 years, uh, the state of Texas had no problem doing whatever it needed to do to safeguard uh, its own communities and its own sovereignty. Uh, and that included, for that period of 75 years, uh, uh, you know, occasionally entering Mexico to capture criminals or returning people to Mexico when necessary. And it was state authorities who carried it out in accordance with state law. And nobody minded back then. Now, why did it stop? Well, it stopped because Mexico, about 1920, uh, became a mostly peaceful autocracy for the next 90 years. That's the real reason it ended. It didn't end because Texas suddenly lost the power it had as a sovereign state. So I, I want to submit this to get back to the question, if we accept the premise, which I think is accurate, that Washington, D.C. is not going to do anything, and the federal government's not going to do anything, the state of Texas, in the year 2021, can still do everything that the state of Texas could do in 1845. 100%. And we have to have the imagination and the courage to rediscover that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Angela Prather. Um, I want to first thank you for, for coming. Um, but most of all, I want to thank the Sheriff's Department, County Judge, and our Border Patrol, um, Highway Patrol, all our first responders, because we're doing everything we can to keep you all safe. We're, we're working exhausted hours, we're seeing horrible things, having to exhaust our, re our resources because a truck took a bunch of people and wrecked into, wrecked into a vehicle that had a father and daughter a father and young little girl coming down to spend the weekend at the lake. Yep. What happened? It exhausted our resources. I know the sheriff's department was exhausted. That took all of our resources to save these two people from our citizens. We have 50,000, hopefully with the census, 50,000 citizens. What was the number? 100,000 passing through? 
That's ridiculous. So, I understand, I want the citizens to know that all the first responders are doing everything we can to help you. But y'all need to get us help. That's right. Because we can't do our job. Well, we can, because this is a hell of a city. I'm sorry. <laughs> and our mission as and first responders... See the pastor after that. Yeah. I've been in the principal's office a couple times. Um, we just got through the COVID, right? Hopefully, knock on wood, we're there. But we just lost all our resources that were supporting us through the COVID. People are just getting out, trying to enjoy their life, and they can't. So yes, we're a sovereign, we are a sovereign state. By God, I'll, I'll go dig the fence. I'll go dig holes. I don't care. Whatever you need, sure. You know I'm there, and I'll try to keep my mouth shut, sir. But I will do whatever you need and bring as many people as I can to get this done. We have the Texas Guard. They're picking up trash. The National Guard's picking up trash. Really? Why aren't they building the wall? No. Aren't they our, our National Guard? Isn't this a sovereign state? Why aren't they building that wall that's already paid for? Come on. Yeah. We can pick up trash. We can build the wall. Yes, ma'am. I agree. This, this community here is a diamond in the rough. It's a beautiful place to live. And we've always been safe. We've always stuck together. That's and right. we're going to make it through this. Yes. That's right. But I can tell you right now, you guys, yeah. all of us, the whole community, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Del Rio Chamber of Commerce, the everybody in our community, we need to stand as one. Yes. And if right. Governor Abbott yeah. comes down here, we need all of us here. Right. All of us. So I want to say God bless you to the to the father and daughter that were saved that day. And I want to say God bless you to the first responders that were there and the, the, the Justice of the Peace Sheriff um, that saw that horrific, horrific, unnecessary loss of life thrown about our highways. Unnecessary. Let's go, Del Rio. Can I say one thing just real quick, and I promise not to be long-winded? I ask y'all, every night at 8 o'clock, I pray for Texas, President Trump. I ask y'all to join in with me at 8 o'clock. That is the way World War II was won in the said the whole nation of England prayed. Now I ask y'all to join in with me 8 o'clock every night and let's get it done with the power of the Lord behind you. Amen. Amen. You go ahead. Okay, um, so I have a kind of a comment and question for all of you and mostly for like the legal background people. You know, a lot of people, when they hear, I mean, they, they come to vent. A lot of times they're frustrated, they're angry. But, you know, they don't understand when you say that we have our own sovereignty. Because a lot of that hasn't been taught that it's our hands that have to do the work. They look to their leadership and their leadership ain't doing it. Yeah. So I have to implore all of you that it's up to every single one of us. It's not them trying to push the buck on us. It's our work. Uh, you know, in one of the books that Judge Scalia wrote, he talked about how uh, the county judges and local judges actually have a lot of sway and power as far as how laws are made in the federal level. And so if we can do something to empower our local judges, our county judges, uh, through immigration law, uh, educating, I mean, there's not going to be a judge in the county uh, or 
in the courthouse in New Valley, Texas, who's going to know immigration law. That's not their job. So I think that we need to develop a way to get knowledge of immigration law to these county and local judges so that when these cases, they need to be persecuted, you know, prosecuted in our counties and in our cities. You know, and they, the federal and the county overlap because of what's going on right now in the country. But we need to really dig deep and say, hey, look, they're breaking the laws in our backyard, in our counties. Last week, I think it was, somebody walked into HEB, two or three of them with right. guns. So we need to know, you know, first of all, if we defend ourselves as citizens, are we going to be protected from anything that we do? We, we don't need Kamala Harris or anybody else coming out here and say, well, you shot an immigrant. I'm going to tell you what, I'm a first wave immigrant. And I love this country. And it, it just infuriates yeah. me that the system has dumped our children down and everyone down for the last 20, 30 years. They don't know their own laws and their own rights. I beg you, please read your laws and rights. They're very important, but it really, I really think that, especially you gentlemen who are lawyers and uh, advocates, I, am, I really ask you to reach out to judges and, and pass that information, immigration law, anything that we can do to curtail some of these problems. Because a lot of them, and I'll, I'll be very blunt, I spent some time with a, a local judge where I'm at, and he was not aware of, of how certain laws operated because yes. they're out of his jurisdiction. Yes. And so we really need to empower and stand behind our judges. And whatever we can do, uh, by all means, I, I would like to collect all your cards so that I can keep up with all of your websites so that I know, you know if there's anything that I can do at the local level to help that along, you know, by all means. That's right. That's yeah, right. If, if the panel's okay. Can we rapid fire everybody's questions so y'all can hear the input? And then if y'all want to tackle something urgent, then just go ahead and hear what the people have for you. We ready? Go ahead. All right. Um, just really quickly, a couple of stories. I'm one of those people that works in Mexico. I go across there every day. I have to have a green card. They come and check me at least once every two months. If I don't have that green card, guess what? I could get fined. My company could get shut down, and I get sent across the border, and I don't get to come back. Yeah. I also pay taxes in Mexico, like $15,000 worth every year. So if I have to do it, why is it that we're letting all these people come in and handing them money and not doing anything for the people of the Americans? I already got that off my chest. But now, to what the judge was saying, I know I'm over there shaking my head is because I want to jump up and I want to tell you. Um, I'm not politically correct and I will not apologize for that because truth is truth and fact is fact. Bottom line. But for the first time ever in my life, I was called racist this year. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I said I wanted to pop her in the mouth so hard. But the Lord put his hands like on me and the devil got behind me. So it's all good. All right. To, in, in all seriousness, folks, we do need to do what the judge is saying. We need to be problem solvers. We're up here. We can tell all the stories. And I just found out, last of the story, that hotel that was, they sent all the workers out of in Anascosa County, and they let all the immigrants, the illegal immigrants, go into. A relative of mine was a housekeeper there. She was just raped a week ago. So these people are not here because, oh my God, they want to make a better life. Even the people in the Acuna communities are sick of it. They're sick of it. They want them to go away. Two of my workers that work with me in Maquila Lora, one of them had to go home from work because his little boy was having a standoff with an illegal alien, not from Mexico, but a Haitian. It was in their house while they were home. His wife and two children pulled a knife on his son. Son's being chased down the street. Another individual comes to work, he's beat to kingdom come, and he won the fight. <laughs> Broke into his home while they were home, while his wife and children were home. Found a body. You don't always hear about these things unless you are over there all the time. Um, young girl was raped, broad daylight, dumped. This stuff is going on, and it's going to come across here. It already is. These people aren't here to help us. They're not here to live the American dream. They're here to destroy us. You've got it. You're absolutely right. So let's be part of the solution. Do not be part of the problem.
We've got to find out what we need to do. And I, and I mean it when I say, stop them from coming over here. Uncuff our, our agents. Let them do their job. And if they don't, can't do it with the federal yeah. government, then let the state of Texas hire them and turn them loose. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to thank you all for, for being here. I, I just want to start off by saying that I, I love my country. And uh, two grandparents in, uh, in World War II. Uh, I've got a daughter on her third, one on her third tour overseas. I was in the Air Force 10 years. I was a Border Patrol agent for 22 years. Thank you. And uh, for the judge and the sheriff, you want to know what the cost is of not detaining these guys? They're up there. They're those kids were killed. Have you ever made a walk up to an agent's house? I have to tell the, the wife, the kids that they died, they got killed. And I, I've, I've had to do that. I was a chaplain for 13 years. That's the cost. You guys want to talk about cost. Talk about the people being killed. Not just them, but the illegal aliens that are, are dying because they have to come. Because I've had to tell their families too, hey, I've actually held an illegal alien while they died. Their last breath was in them. And then I have to go tell her parents. I have to go tell her twin brother that she died. That's the cost that we're facing as a, as a nation. You guys want to know how you want to close this border down? Follow the law. We practice zero tolerance here in Del Rio sector. I got here in 2011. I was in, uh, excuse me, 2009. I was in New Mexico. We put up a wall. We went from 30,000 out to that one to almost nothing. We went from 10 vehicles driving across that border to almost nothing. We started prosecuting people here in this sector. Our acts went down to almost nothing. I think it was like 9,000 in 2009, 2010, from 100 and something thousand. I've been there at the processing centers in Eagle Pass and see agents buying stuff for the kids that are soaking wet because these parents are driving them across on a tube. It's terrible. That's what's going on over there. It, it, it's preposterous that we're letting this happen. It, it's terrible. You cry for these people, but at the same time, we're inviting them over. It's terrible. Who's the one that was from Dimmick County? Brother, we tried to prosecute people down there. You know why they didn't let us? Because it's a different district, the Southern District. Oh, I, I talked, I talked to Senator Tillis. I talked to Senator Corn. I gave him a high-level briefing three years ago. Where we're at now? Nowhere. It's still happening. They're exploiting our judicial system. I wrote up a, a, uh, a change of law to, to go up there to Trump, to change the meaning of 8 U.S.C. 1325 so we can prosecute people in that thing. Where is that at now? It's nowhere. And unless we do something about it, as a citizenry, in a legal, holy way, you guys all started off by saying it's nonpartisan. Well, let, well, let me say something. The Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I was, I was a border patrol agent under Clinton, and saw Santa Teresa horse patrol agents taken down by the Mexican military. Patrol agent under Bush and saw Operation Jumpstart with broader apprehensions down. I was a border patrol agent under Obama, reverse course, back to it again. And now I was a border patrol agent under Trump. It is a partisan issue. You guys have to deal with that. It really is a partisan issue. And until you recognize it, and it's great that you guys want to be bipartisan, but not everybody wants to play that game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, like the sheriff, that man over there, that sheriff is a hard worker. He, he's good. I don't know the judge, but I know the sheriff. And I've worked with him because I was in prosecution with him. That jail is packed full. And it's hard. But we can do something. We need to do something. That's all I have to say. God bless you. We're going to go and get just uh, in our panelists' defense. Those are my words. Bipartisan. They have their own beliefs, and we just want to keep it on track and not get diverted into conflict. My name is Viva Yejo. I have seen this problem right in front of my house every day for years. And most of them have not been from the Central America area. They're Muslims, Pakistanis, Indians, Somalis, and people from Africa, all coming. And we never hear that they're arrested. But here's the problem. The majority of all these people are coming with fake documents. And no one is vetting them. And part of those illegal aliens are then, once they're processed, 
are taken down as refugees. And as refugees, they get money from us. And we support them. We give them housing. In Amarillo, they tore down an entire neighborhood. The women in domain took their homes away to house the Muslims. That's what's happening. Yeah. Because they're coming here and we call them illegal aliens and they are. But all they have to do is get across and touch the U.S. ground and they get picked up by Mercedes Vance vans here. And Border Patrol does not do anything about it because they have the money. Because they're coming in and they're going to start businesses. And all these nonprofit groups, they go out there to Mexico, they go to South America, they go to Somalia, they invite them. They show them what to do, and they bring them here. And then they come here and they charge us to pay them to take care of them. That's what you all need to work on. Those nonprofit groups, if they have any association or affiliations with anyone out in those countries, they need to be shut down. to be brought here, we're paying for them to be transported here, we're paying for them to buy new clothes because they're wearing better clothes than we are. Yeah. We were at the river one day and there were a couple of black people that were picked up. Their clothes was better than ours. We watched them carry their big duffel bags. They, had, they, they were like maybe 20 feet from the river. They weren't wet. How did they get across? And they didn't care. They were happy as could be. Their shoes were not muddy, their shoes were not dusty. So we need to do something about those nonprofits, and we need to do something about those refugees. We cannot be labeling them refugees, we cannot be bringing them here as refugees if they don't have legal documentations from their countries. We have a senator right now, Omar, who changed her name in the United Kingdom so she could come to the United States. It's ridiculous. That's what you all need to be working on. Thank you. Hello, my name is Robert Smith. I'm a really shy person about expressing my uh, opinion, but uh, I just got over it. <laughs> it won't happen again. All right, Texas is, like was stated, a sovereign state. Texas being a sovereign state, who do we work for? Do we work for the U.S. government? No. No. Not at all. They are supposed to work for us. Right. Now, the moment that they stop working for us, the state has to take control of the situation. That's right. We have laws on the books. We have the power. We don't have to empower somebody to do anything. They have the power. They don't have the intestinal fortitude to stand up and do the laws that are on the books. The minute that they do that, things will change. It's sickening. I love people from all over the world, let me tell you. I've got friends on my Facebook from literally all over the world. Well, no, none from China. Anyway, but other than that, pretty much all over the world. So I don't have, I'm not a racist. But if you can't come here legally, you don't belong here. If, just imagine this picture, okay? Here's the whole United States. What if Texas had the guts enough to stand up and fulfill the laws that are on the books? We don't need new laws. That's right. We've got them. What if we stood up and we fulfilled those laws? We backed the laws that we have. You're here. That's right. These, these coyotes? after sending the same people across after they can't pay anymore, they're going to say, you know what? Let's go to New Mexico, try to get across. Let's go to Arizona, try to get across. California, they need to go over there. <laughs> Give us the rest of their right. 
but yeah, let them in. Texas is a sovereign state. Texas needs to stand up and do their job or they need voted out. And that's all I got to say. I'm a local Del Rio girl. My last name is Chipoy. My ancestry is Losoya. And uh, I live in my ancestral home. Y'all were on my street today. Judge Allen took you by there. I see busloads and busloads every morning, sometimes at night, two times, sometimes two buses, sometimes three buses. So that's either 100 or 150 illegal aliens. I am a retired CBP DHS supervisory officer. I've been retired for 14 years. This is my home, and I'm not running. I'm not leaving here. I will stay and fight. And kind of heading off of what Ms. Vallejo said, I'm going to give you something to think about. It is a warning. We all lived through 9-11. Yes. I believe it was Victor who said, do you remember 9-11? Okay. These Venezuelans and the Haitians are being let go here under the temporary protective status that has been given to them. Along on that list of countries is Iran, is Syria. Syria is a state sponsor of terrorism since 1979. Somalia, remember Black Hawk Down? Those are the people. Yemen, Sudan. These people are serious about coming here and they plan to hurt us. You know, out here in Del Rio, they're not going to get a lot of play from the press if they blow something up. Y'all live over on the other side of this country. I'm sorry, but it may be in your backyard. So please, do something about this temporary protective status. These people can be given residency and eventually citizenship, but I think they'll blow us up before that ever happens. United States citizen of America. I'm Jose Martinez. I'm, I live here in Del Rio, Texas. I was born in Del Rio, Texas. I would like to let you guys know that I follow those buses to Orla. I follow those buses to Pecos, Texas, to Mentone, Texas. And the target uh, lodging bank camp is where they're keeping them. And you guys, a lot of people don't know. I call the Midland News. They don't know anything about it. Uh, we like to report that. I will, will come on over here. I'll show you. They never came. I called uh, Project Veritas. They never came. I called Stacy, uh, Stacy on the right show, and she said for me to send her pictures. I sent her pictures. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'm, we might have uh, Telemundo next week, and uh, I hope I can come out on the show. So uh, I'm very proud to do that, and I, I will do that because I love America. One more thing, sir, everybody, uh, ma'am. Uh, back in 1975 to uh, 1980, uh, President Ronald Reagan, he fought the radical leftists, Marxists. And guess what? They're coming back. Thank you. Y'all, we're going to limit it to a couple more brief comments, and then we're going to turn it back over to the panel to close everything up for y'all tonight. I'll be brief. As are you aware that a Chinese billionaire with connections to the Chinese military has purchased a 130,000 acre property in Val Verde County where they plan to extend a 6,000 foot airstrip to 10,000 feet so that they will be capable of handling any
very large military cargo planes, and they also plan to install a wind generator farm so that they can connect directly to the Texas electric power grid. I believe this is a national security risk, yes. and I do believe that it is connected to this whole illegal invasion. Thank you. It is. Hi there. Thank you. My name is Allison Anderson, and I'm relatively new to Del Rio. Previous to Del Rio, uh, my husband and I started a family, and we lived on a 200 square section ranch somewhere a little ways, crows fly south of Marathon. My experiences are all that I really have to bring forth tonight, and I know that I have way too many to share with everyone, but as a mom of three little girls, new in Del Rio, you can try. <laughs> New in Del Rio, I can tell you that from where we were at on our ranch is similar to where we're at now here in Del Rio. We live west of town, and I have encountered everything from convicted rapists, convicted murderers, uh, resident alien card holders that are trying to bypass being caught at the port of entry coming back into the states because they've killed families in other states. Uh, my husband is Border Patrol. And he'd probably hate that I would say that because he is not super proud of what is going on and putting on his uniform every day. But that man has saved lives where we used to live and he is EMT here in town and he continues to save lives. I can say that Border Patrol is literally trying to do everything that they can within their power to keep this town safe, to keep the community safe, to keep everybody's family safe. Their hands are legitimately tied. As of in the last couple of weeks, we have had illegals on our property starting fires. We had a bailout, the helicopter on our property, DPS, I think it was three or four units came in the morning. I was outside feeding our livestock with our, with our daughters when the helicopter and a high-speed chase ended on our property. We had to run back to our house. I had to get my pistol, like I used to have to do on the ranch, but now here in this community that we moved to to get away from it. I was told to contact Congress. Our congressman, every single time something happened on the ranch, we had naked illegals sleeping in the beds. We've had them break into the house and cut themselves on the glass and bleed all through over the house, use baby blankets to clean it up or wrap themselves with. At the same time, they raid the refrigerator and call Ecuador for four hours. Vehicles have been stolen, boats have been stolen, dead bodies have popped up everywhere. I've seen them in every single state you can possibly imagine. If it was your daughters, if it was your wives, if it was your family, if they were your little kids that, why can't we play outside today, Mom? No, I'm not really super comfortable with putting my pistol on and sitting there watching the brush line. How would you guys feel? I contacted Will Hurd's office every single time someone was arrested on our property. I, I know, oh I know, but you know what? I was mad enough to where I called just to call because they were going to hear me because no one else was listening. I talked to Justin Hollis, if anyone is familiar with him. He promised wars on the ranch. He wanted to come down and see exactly what we were dealing with. We had groups of hundreds scattered all the way down our section of ranch from, I mean, it was big enough, all the way out just by Big Bend National Park, but there were bodies everywhere. People, live people everywhere. And I guess my point is, if, if you want us to do something as a community, as people, let me know. Like, I am mad. I've held people at gunpoint until Border Patrol has arrived to keep my family safe. I've had people try to break into my house while I'm home with a newborn. Twice! Not just once, twice! I, I mean, I, I don't know what else I can do as a community member, as a taxpayer, for God's sakes, to get something done. And it was implied to me through Will Hurt's office, through Justin Hollis, that when I asked, what would need to be done? Like, do I literally have to get murdered and my kids raped before you guys admit that there's a crisis happening down here? And that was all I needed to hear. That was it. So I, I just, if you want us to do something, if there's something we can do as a community, I don't know, tell me what it is, because I'm willing to do it. If I have to, like someone else said, if I gotta dig holes, I got my boots on, I don't mind digging the holes, but I'm tired of feeling unsafe on my own property. I'm tired of it. That's right. I want to do something for us. Some of the people in here know me. I'm Paige Day. I ranch outside on Sycamore 90. We're in Valverde and Kinney County. My grandparents' land, we've been here forever. A lot of people know my grandparents. And they've done a lot of cattle work out here. I run an outfitting business. And 
What y'all don't understand, I have a very good relationship with Warchel. And hands out to our local law enforcement, Judge Owens, Sheriff, <coughs> they are trying to do what they can, but their hands are tied. I mean, they have no resources. Like the other day, I called guys coming through the property all the time, honest. And you call them, hey, can't send anybody. Okay, so we're on our own. Rangers out here, I'm on my own. Wife and kids, you know. The other thing y'all don't realize, what about the Godaways? Which I don't know if y'all, that's the term virtual use, but the ones that get away. What about the ones we're not catching? What's those numbers? What are those numbers? Bigger, triple, double it, right? That's concerning too. How many of those terrorists who we don't know? But they already let out five of my fallacy. I paid five hundred, eight hundred dollars a piece on them. They're gone. They're in the pasture. They're cutting fences. Other people across from me got deer breeder pens. They got five hundred to a million dollars worth of white tail. They're cutting their fences, letting them out. It's an economic impact on us. That only is it for the town and stuff too. But I'm trying to run a business. The other day, I had a hunter out. What happens? This guy walks by, and he says, hey, I got one. I said, don't do nothing. Just sit there. He said, the guy walked right by him, smiled, just like, oh, I'm in the country free. I can do what I want. And I mean, this is getting ridiculous. I mean, I've been here since 1995, and I've been through the first influx. But it wasn't that bad. They came through, went through. But these new groups, they're new. And you got to realize that what we're dealing with on the ranches is you're not dealing with the women and children. You're dealing with the ones that are dangerous. They can't get in the country. Yeah. They're, they're pedophiles. They're murderers. You name it. They got a rap sheet this big. And that did, so, you know, we're more fearful on the ranchers. And I've seen some things. Now when I drive by, you see they come up, hey, you got water? No, they're running like deer, jumping the fence and stuff. They're, they're not, they don't want to give up. They know they can keep going. And, I mean, I mean I'm going to, that's what I want to know from the state. Is the state going to reimburse some of these ranchers and stuff for the, Stuff we lost, or you know, we need some something back for the kids. It's not cheap. Things are going up. Money's going. And I mean, the other thing too, you know, y'all need to know that uh, Mr. Paxton with Kenny County invited me to go over there, and they were going to do a project and an interview. They didn't show up to that. They called me this week, Tuesday, Wednesday. I was supposed to meet with them. They're do their project video of the ranches and what's being torn up and that to help. Guess what? No show. I haven't got a call. So, up there, they're not even doing it. Do they care? I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Is it? But, and the other thing you need to know, too, we have towers on our property. I always mess up the name. I think they're animal, but Borchel has on our property. They're probably half a million dollar towers. Two of them. Well, guess what? There's money spent that they can't use. They're, they're picking out the leg and then coming by the house and stuff every night, but guess what? They can't use them. They can't have anybody send out there to go get them. So, luckily, the other day, they finally got people from Sector to come and help try to capture Group 13. But at the end of the day, like I said, I had to teach my kids, 11 and 13 year old, how to properly use a weapon and stuff in my house. Yeah. Wow. Because that's how we were getting down here. Yeah. That's right. You know, everybody, and it, it's hard for us, and, and the sheriff and them, I, it's, I, I agree with them. They got the problems in town, too, and all this influx of this going on and helping what they're breaking in out here. But the ranchers, they're, who's there? Nobody. I mean, they broke into the neighbor's house next to us. They ransacked it, and they urinated all over the floor and everything. I mean, it's bad. It's getting bad, bad, bad on the ranchers. That's why we need to figure out and go back to the old ways or something to do it where we can free up our... I mean, whether it's higher outsource to process them, that way, at least Borchow will go back and do their job they were designed to do. Was be Borchow agents, not adult babysitters, not processing. So that's pretty much my feelings on it. I wanted to come from an outside standpoint as an outfitter, rancher, been here. And like I said, my business, I've even had hunters that said they didn't want to come down here and hunt. I've had cancellations because of that. So I want to know who's going to pay for it, you know? Just like that hunter, it was his last day, that guy walked by the last day. He didn't get a chance to shoot what he wanted to because they scared the deer off. So what, what do I got to do? Talk to him, hey man, if you want to come back, I'll give you a discount or something. I'm losing money. And after the COVID, we were really shut down. And then we've had anthrax on our property. And we were thinking was going through. Now this hits, I don't know what to say or do, you know. But please, just start helping us. The ranchers need it.
actually really could do something on this. We have been hollering about this for a while. Um, <clears throat> sorry, disaster, FEMA, Cheatham. And yes, they answered a disaster, and we're really glad about that. But there is no reason that all these ranchers that are occurring so much expense at the invasion that the federal government has let happen that they cannot get reimbursed. We last Saturday put out some papers for them to actually finally turn in something so we could kind of get an idea. It is a lot. I mean, it's 100000 per ranch on a lot of them. I think that's probably something that somebody up here on the stage could take under their belt and find out how come they cannot get reimbursed. Just like a normal, if water came through the ranch and tore out the, the fence, that would happen. Tatum would step in. So there has to be a way to tweak that law to get their money back. I'm going to address everyone here. Um, I don't want to be up here. I'm not a speaker, but I'm in a position to where I feel like I have to speak to every one of you tonight. The property that Laura spoke of earlier with the ramp, my husband is 50% owner in that property. And what's taking place there, we are totally against. But unfortunately, we have a partner in that, that property there, and she has leased her property to the state of Texas. That was without our knowledge. And I just found out, out about this about a week ago. And anyway, I just I want to apologize to all of you. And like I say, we, we are not a part of that. And um, we spoke to the D DPS, the troopers, and the sheriff's department two weeks ago when we were here. And we told them, at that point, we had no idea at least. We told them absolutely no one on our property except the owners, which is my husband and myself, and the partner, Tanya. We said, law enforcement, you know, it's free to go on our property. We left the gate open, you know, so they would have easily ac easy access because we thought they were doing their job. So they were going to apprehend people that shouldn't be on our property. That's what we were under the impression of. So one of the troopers slipped and informed me that the property had been leased. So then at that point, you know, I started making phone calls, called the sheriff's department, finally got a hold of uh, one of the rangers that actually um, <coughs> made the agreement with um, our partner. And um, anyway, I'm sorry, my, my mind's frazzled. I haven't had much sleep. But. So, you know, he informed us of the situation. And anyway, after, two weeks ago when we were here, my husband and I, you know, pulled the fence up as best we could, put up no trespassing signs. And like I say, we, we informed the troopers and the sheriff's department, the deputies, that no one was to be on that property. And the incident that Laura mentioned earlier, three days after we told them no one on the property is when that incident occurred. They walked them right through our, not through the gate, we closed and locked the gate, walked them through our fence that had been stomped down and sat them on our property. You know, we were told by one of the deputies, you know, don't be surprised if in a few years you don't have a lawsuit. But yet, they are corralling them on our property, holding them there until the buses arrive to pick them up. And apparently there's nothing I can do about it because our partner leased it. So, anyway, I, I contacted... Um, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I just, I'm not a good speaker. Um, I contacted um, the ranger and I told him, I said, I'm going to go fix the fence. Well, we don't recommend you do that, okay? I called him again today because I stirred up a hornet's nest. I went out today, I locked that front gate that I was nice enough to leave open because I thought they were doing their job. I locked the front gate, I put up panels. There was a reporter there with me today. I don't know if she wants me to call her out. She watched me this morning repair a fence myself. You know, I had to go buy materials that I shouldn't be having to spend money out of my pocket on. You know, I spent the whole morning, I was sweating and I was filthy when I was done. But I went out there and, you know, I know it's, I know they'll just, you know, tear the fence down somewhere else. But it eased my conscience knowing that I was doing something. And, of course, the um, ranger called me today after everyone knew that I had been out to my property. You know, I can't even stay on my property. I'm renting a hotel. <coughs> I will have paid for five nights now by the time I go home to have a room in town when I have a perfectly good house sitting there that I should be able to stay in. Anyway, today, 
and I, I'm about done. When I spoke to the ranger today, you know, he said, well, the illegals, or whatever they're calling them, they're coming onto your property. You know, and he said, we're, we're apprehending them. I said, well, I fixed the fence today, and the gates are locked. So unless they're tearing my property up, they shouldn't be on my property. He told me if I did not give them a key to my gates, they would cut my, cut my locks off. Is what I was told today. But they are telling me that they're apprehending them on, my, on our property. That's why they want to have it leased. And also, go ahead and tell you this one. I said, I don't want them on my property. I don't want the liability. I said, why don't you turn them and walk them down behind my fence line and walk them out elsewhere? And their reasoning was, we don't want them to drown. And my response, well, they should not have been in the water in the first place. That is exactly what I said. Because I am furious. This should not be happening. That's all I got to say. Sure, go ahead. Do any of y'all know a law or something that Abbott could do that would allow us to return them? Is there something on the books that Abbott can do that we can hold him to it? Okay, I'm going to turn this over. Which one of y'all? Y'all arm wrestle for it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give it to Joshua, and then after that, y'all pass it along, and, and yeah. we'll close it. Well, I, I've got something even better. Uh, there's no law that says he can't. That's right. I mean, that's, that, 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 that's the that's beginning right. and end of it. Look, the, there was, the, you know, Air, the state of Arizona, about a decade back, uh, tried to uh, use state uh, resources and authorities to enforce immigration law, and they got sued uh, by the Obama administration. And uh, the Supreme Court uh, at the time, you know, given the, which is not the same composition now, uh, but uh, they, they they returned rulings saying that oh you know states can't do anything with immigration. Well you know you know be, you, conservatives again I've got to be careful to be nonpartisan and I understand that's not that's not popular with the entire crowd. But but but, but I'll say something about conservatives because because they're conservative Democrats and Republicans. Uh, conservatives have a problem and I include myself in this uh, in that uh, when a judge tells us something we say oh that's the answer okay okay yeah, yeah. The, the other side does not do that. All right, and in this case, the Supreme Court got it wrong. Right. Completely wrong. So we got to challenge it. We got to litigate against it, and our authorities need to need to do the right thing. And I would submit that if there were a plan, which we've been discussing today, uh, to uh, re revive that and bring it back before the court, that with a six-three supermajority, the outcome might be different. However, we shouldn't wait for that to do the right thing. Just to add to what Josh said, uh, he's exactly right. Like we, again, trying to be nonpartisan only because my organization has to be. I can give you my personal view, which is that the other worldview, um, they get shot down and they get up the next day and they charge twice as hard, and our side just kind of shrugs. Texas needs to pass, if it wants to go this route, a driver's license for citizens only law. It has to start making it clear that benefits and rights only to go accord to citizens and not non-citizens. And it'll go up to, through the courts and that'll be fine. And maybe we'll get lucky. And if we get struck down, we do it again. We do it again. We do it again until we get the result we need. Regarding regarding the, the question you asked about what's to stop us, the answer is really nothing. Local law enforcement, state authorities can ship these people to the other side of the river. And that would make some lawyers go out like, clutch at pearls and say, well, you can't do that. No one's going to arrest you. The president is not going to come to Texas and arrest Governor Abbott or A.G. Paxton or Sheriff Martinez. No one's going to get arrested. So I'd actually encourage you to put a bunch of these guys in a boat, give them a couple sandwiches, and send them back across the river and see what happens. There will be no consequence. If someone in Washington starts crumbling, dare them to come down here and have a conversation about it. Some of you heard me, and, and, and these folks all day just heard me beat the, uh, you know, the Constitution into their head. And they're experts on it by any chance, but Article 1 allows us to defend ourselves as a sovereign state. A lot of you have been saying that, 
and we more than agree, but you need a governor who's going to throw his jewels on the table of the president and say enough is enough because we are dying out here. And it's a matter of time before somebody kills somebody. And we're not going to be able to defend against that because guess what? This is a very liberal government that's going to make an example out of you if you do something against an illegal alien. So I understand the plight, and my heart breaks because I'm from this town right here. I could see this coming. I didn't think it was going to be this bad. But the, the Constitution is the Constitution. And some of us are working really hard. The gentleman that just left that said, you got to do more. We are working to get these folks here. Governor Abbott is going to be here next week. Ask him this. One more. Kim Reynolds, she's the Iowa governor, back in 2019 looked at the president and said, we do, want, we do not want any illegal alien children in our state. When Governor Abbott shows up, ask him why we allow illegal alien children in our state. It does not matter that we are on the border. We are a sovereign state. The Constitution says these United States. It does not say the federal government of the United States. So That's right. I applaud you for what you're doing, please, but you're going to have to show up next week and force bring yourself and 10 more people and give the governor, give the governor a run for his money. He has to earn the fact that he's the state governor. If you're that upset, next week is your chance to, to say something. Thank you. So I, I, I used to teach constitutional law, and you were right. The state is sovereign. And I don't disagree with that at all. That's 100% true, and it's important. It's an important protection of our rights. But I do want to add something to that. It would be a mistake to only focus on the state for this reason. We ought to, others, I'm not suggesting one or the other. I'm suggesting both. And my only reason for that is this. The, the, the fight to defend America and its border ought not just be borne by the people here in Del Rio. It's a national issue. People in Virginia. People, like, for example, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, did we say, well, Hawaii's got a problem. <laughs> Or, you know, no, we didn't do that. And I would argue that's a similar principle. So I, I think we have to make sure I'm not wanting what I'm saying to suggest in any way, shape, or form that you should limit your, your hopes and your aspirations and the pressure and the demands that you put on the, the, the state to act. And, and, and uh, I, that's, it, that's very important. And also, a point was made earlier about what the Constitution says. The courts are a tertiary source of what the Constitution says. The first source is the actual text of the Constitution. The next best source is what the people who wrote it said about it. That's a secondary source. Tertiary source is what the current court says about it. And yet, and when I taught constitutional, I told my students that. And I said, so if you tell me what courts say about the Constitution, but don't tell what the Constitution says, you're going to get a bad grade because academics requires what? Primary sources first then secondary sources, and then tertiary sources, maybe. And so bottom line is, it's exactly right. If the Supreme Court got it wrong, you've got to give them a second chance to get it right. That's what you do. But, uh, but don't just think of it as a state problem, because there's no reason why the good people of Texas should have to bear this any more than the good people of Hawaii should have had to bear that. It's got to start somewhere. I just want to make one quick comment. I think a lot of these solutions, state sovereignty, that's, that's no doubt correct. Um, there's one other thing that people aren't really thinking about though outside the box, is the Mexican government. Governor Abbott has a lot of pull to make financial hardships for the Mexican government. He can punish them by depleting their legitimate income that they receive through the borders, through trade, punish them enough to where it exceeds the illegitimate income, and tell the Mexican government until you fix the border crisis and you start doing something a year in, I'm closing all the TxDOT roadways to each port. Yes. And I'll put it up one at a time. Mm -hmm. If you stop the illegal immigration, I'll open up one. If it keeps going, I'll shut it back down. If it, can, if it improves, I'll open up another. You gotta treat them like a little child. Yep. And, and they can do a lot more than we can, the Mexican government can. That's right. So that's another part of the puzzle that we have to consider. I want to thank you all for coming this evening, and before we break up, uh, I just want to share with you kind of a spectrum of policy considerations that we're making at uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation, 
and some of the folks we're working with as well. And so if it sounds a little wonky and it goes a little long, I apologize. But, but uh, much of it has to do with our visit here uh, today. And I've been invited by C-SPAN to be on their radio, on their television program on next Friday. And they want to talk to me about our visit to Del Rio and what we learned. And so I'm going to have plenty to talk to them about, not the least of which is an issue that was brought up early last night in our conversation with Victor. And he mentioned that in his discussion with, with CBP, that they were no longer issuing uh, NTAs, meaning notices to appear to immigration courts in the future, they were issuing NTRs. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I was a, mem I was a chairman of a subcommittee that had jurisdiction over uh, immigration policy. My colleague and friend uh, from Texas, Lamar Smith, held that position before me. Anything I know of any merit has to do with his uh, teaching me that that, but but I asked I asked Lamar, have you ever heard of an NTR, a notice to report, meaning not a notice to appear before an immigration judge, but a notice to report to an ICE office somewhere in the country, um, and and he said no, it's just been recently, and I asked a retired CBP officer, and he said I was doing this for 20 years, I retired in February. I've never heard of a notice to report. Second time. Then we go to the uh, NGO today and uh, talk to her about what, what they're doing. And she's saying that in, in the past, when they've, when they've gotten in 25 to 40 individuals a week to process to work with, in the first three days of this week, they got 1,000. But she said that's all going away because CBP is going to a new process. They're not going to do NTAs, they're going to do NTRs, which means they're going to move folks uh, to ICE out locations rather than keep them, keeping them at, at, uh, at border stations. Now, it, it, it sounds really wonkish and it sounds like we're dancing on the head of a pin and that sort of thing, but that's the way things go from time to time in Washington, D.C. When the executive branch starts doing things that aren't authorized in law, and when they start doing things that aren't authorized in law, we generally call that lawlessness. And when it's done on the part of the individual who is constitutionally obligated to faithfully execute the laws of the United States, it becomes a really big deal. So next Friday on C-SPAN, we're going to talk about this thing that has come out of the blue because this, president, this executive branch, and I'm not being partisan, I'm just saying that this executive branch, this Article II branch, is doing something that is, by definition, lawless. And we can't have that. So that's on one end of the spectrum. But the other end of the spectrum is something that we've worked on recently with Congressman Arrington from the 19th District of Texas here. And Congressman Arrington is introducing a resolution, he introduced it today, that talks about this very issue of what the states have sovereign authority to do. When the framers framed the Constitution, they framed it in such a way realizing that states were not going to give up all of their authority or not even close to all of their authority. So they put in Article 1, Section 10, this provision that says, no state shall, without the consent of Congress, engage in war unless actually invaded or if imminent danger will not admit of delay. And what that meant was the framers, Madison, Hamilton, Franklin, uh, Sherman, Washington, knew that if they didn't leave states the authority to defend themselves, That's right. the Constitution would never be ratified. That's right. So today in the Constitution, there is that authority, and Congressman Arrington has introduced a resolution to remind Congress that states like Texas, who are being invaded, who are being invaded, have the reserved authority under the Constitution. Reserved authority, not delegated authority. The Constitution didn't give that authority to states. It reserved that authority to the states. So that states can defend themselves against the invasion that's taking place. So when you think about what the Texas Public Policy Foundation is doing, what Heritage Foundation is doing, what what the Remembrance Project, what we're all doing up here through the Border Security Coalition, <laughs> understand we're looking at policy in a wide spectrum from things such as small as just changing a word in a document that makes the actions of the executive branch 
by definition, lawless, up to and real, remembering, reminding our fellow citizens that the state of Texas, the state of California, the state of Arizona, the state of Indiana has the reserved authority, the reserved power to defend itself when the federal government will not do it. Right. And we're doing all of these things as a result of the feedback we get from friends like you that are on the front lines, literally on the front lines, fighting these fights when in fact, as, as George has mentioned, this shouldn't be your fight. Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution says that the United States shall uh, protect the states against invasion. That's right. It actually explicitly says that. But, but they were smart enough to know, the framers were smart enough to know that there might be a president someday that would dere be derelict in that duty, so we're going to reserve them this other, this other authority to right. protect themselves. Yeah. So we very much appreciate your input tonight. We've written things down. We, we're, we're going to take some of these uh, policy suggestions, and some of them we're going to deal with in Washington, D.C. Some of them we're going to bring to the mind, bring to the, the hearing of of uh, uh, Governor Abbott and the folks in Austin, but your input is has been invaluable tonight. And uh, if you're not doing anything more interesting next Friday, you can hear somebody hear a Hoosier talking about visiting Valverde County, uh, Del Rio, uh, next Friday on C-SPAN. And, and I understand you might have a real life, so you won't be doing that. But that will. But I can assure you that will be happening next week. Yeah, yes, sir. So uh, where is Ted Cruz at? I, I thought I thought Ted Cruz was supposed to be down here in Del Rio to speak with the people, but he needs to be here with the governor and hear and hear the people tell him that, so so, so that Ted Cruz can take that to Congress and tell them that and pay for the pay for the border here. But you know, that that's his job, you know. Why 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 why, why is he uh, not doing anything about it? He should be here. You know, associating with the community. They need to work we'll, together. We'll, we'll, yes. we'll, we'll pass that word on. Uh, we'll pass you. that word on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and God bless.